Like many of y'all, we here at the Resource Centers were all affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of us got creative in the ways we hosted events connecting the student body with each other despite the pandemic. Today's episode is really special. We're joined with guests from each of the resource centers here at UCSC to discuss their experiences on how they, along with their resource centers, have dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic and to share some takeaways that they've learned from this experience as well as upcoming events that they are excited for for this upcoming academic year. And now to introduce the guests, if they could share their pronouns, identities, um, resource centers that they are with, and any identities that they are comfortable with sharing. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Des, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the ERC lead assistant and um, one of my identities is Latina. My name is Alejandro Carmona. I just wrapped up my first year at the university. I'm double majoring in Latin American Studies and uh, Educational Justice and Democracy. I work at the Cantu Center and I am a, uh, a one of the trans non-binary uh, interns uh, at the Cantu right now. Oh, my pronouns, him, he, el. <laughs> My name is Carolina Vicente. I use she, her, her pronouns. I'm a student program coordinator at El Centro, um, and I identify as first-gen uh, low-income student. My name is Nicole. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a lead intern at the Women's Center, and I am a trans woman. So my name is Tani Henningsen. I'm a lead intern at the American Indian Resource Center. I am a transfer student, so last year was my first year and this year is my final year, so it's actually my first year on campus. And um, my tribal affiliation is Kong Kao Maidu, and I use she, her pronouns. My name is Tia. Hi. Um, I was an intern with APERC, the AAPI Resource Center on campus. Um, for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, I was a tech and media intern, but I began as a programs intern. Um, and for those who really want to know, I'm a mixed race Chinese American. Oh, and I use she, her pronouns. Hey everyone, my name is Siari Gazacho. My pronouns are she, hers, and I am the fiscal SBC with the African American Resource and Cultural Center. What initially inspired you to work at your specific resource center? What work were they doing that made you think, hmm, maybe this is a place that I would like to work at? So I was inspired to work with APERC kind of shortly after the pandemic began, just because, like, it was, like, a weird, like, moment where we are all, like, kind of had a little more free time to, like, reflect on, like, how things are and, like, what we want to do, I guess. At least that's what I was doing. So I began to realize I want to, like, reflect more on my Chinese identity, um, especially since there's a lot more racism and xenophobia going on towards the Asian and especially Chinese community. At the time, I honestly didn't know a lot about APERC besides that, like, their logo had, like, turtles on it. I remember getting, like, a pin my freshman year and getting the newsletter. But I was at a point in, like, my college, like, career I guess where um, I knew I wanted to do something that possibly help others and like allow me to like continue exploring my racial identity and then also apply my like CREZ major to other settings and then I also thought it would just be a good opportunity to learn more about AAPI communities just because like I didn't get to learn a lot about our history in school and then also within the major um, we were starting to repeat some of the same stuff for like we only focused on um, like the Chinese Exclusion Act or like model minority. So I was like, I want to dig deeper into AAPI history. What initially drew me to the Women's Center was um, COVID. I felt like I was missing a community and a connection to the UC campus um, as a result of like the lockdown and remote instruction. And so I thought getting involved on campus would be a great way to find community again. Just knowing some people, some friendly faces at the Women's Center, as well as knowing the Women's Center mission to center all women of varying uh, identities and experiences and celebrating that. Um, That's why I joined. El Centro really, um, I guess, became like a home away from home for me. I was the first um, in my family to leave home for college. Um, So that was a huge change in my life. El Centro was a space like 
that provided a break from the academics, like a break from the pressures. I just remember being in the lounge and like spending a lot of time in the computer labs. You just quickly make a lot of friends. And yeah, there's always like coffee brewing in the back, like in the lounge. Students are always like venting to one another about how difficult it can be to navigate the university, you know, um, as BIPOC, as first gen students. What events were you most proud of slash felt were a great success despite the pandemic? Before the pandemic, we did an event annually called Drum Feast. And it's probably one of our biggest events that we did. It's like a whole day long celebration where basically indigenous cultures from all over, whether it be native or uh, Mexican indigenous, people from all over come and share the culture. And there's food and there's vendors and it's like a whole thing. And this year, obviously we couldn't do that. So it had to be virtual. And so our team had to figure out a way to make Drum Feast still have that sense of community that it normally has and kind of reinvent it from the ground up. The people who worked on, my fellow interns who worked on Drum Feast came up with the name Indigifest and they had the great idea of having people send in videos of their performances rather than experiencing them in person. And so we had people who were storytellers and dancers and singers and rappers and artists and just all kinds of peoples bringing their kinds of arts and their culture. And they all sent in their videos and um, we had it premiere on YouTube all at the same time and we all like logged in and it had the big countdown and everything. It really felt like you were there in person when I watched it. I remember I parked along Westcliff by the ocean when I watched it premiere. I was laughing really hard and I even like teared up. It was just so beautiful. That was the one event where I really felt connected and almost like I was in person again. If you want to watch it, it's up on our YouTube channel at UCSC American Indian Resource Center. So check it out. Yeah, uh, honestly, one of my uh, most proud event that is actually continuing to happen is called Cutie Pie Movie Night. And what that consisted of um, was finding films that were from either queer artists or just movies in general. Because I was like, you know, uh, let's just, can we have an event where we just hang out and just watch movies and and eat some popcorn or whatnot. And it was very interesting because that was gonna be one of my first events at the university. So um, I was very fortunate that my supervisor was like, okay, write it down. You know that moment where you're like, oh my God, like, oh no, like, cause that means that if I write it down and there's a date, an end date, that means I'm, I have to do it. So when we finally found these three, um, these videos that we're gonna show, these short films, even they were short films, these short films that actually made, empowered me and like normalized to be queer for this couple of seconds. And so it's so crazy to say that, that for this couple of minutes, these, these movies uh, showcase different areas, whether it was people of color, uh, different identities. I don't know, it felt good. People were like, I see myself, I hear myself. So that was really cool. You know, this past year has been really hard on all the RCs since the pandemic. Um, everyone had to figure out how they were going to adapt to an online setting. So, you know, everyone had to figure out like how to continue engaging with students and the community like we usually did. So, you know, for the ERC, we had to figure out how to like, you know, since we don't have the lounge open usually, we're, that was how students and interns and staff were able to connect and like hang out with each other. We had to like find a way to continue that sense of community and continue providing the resources, you know, the, like the food pantry to students and everybody that usually came by. So, you know, that's, you know, when the ERC began or began to distribute our basic needs gift cards. So that was where we had opened a Google form for students to fill out so that they can receive a gift card to one of their vendors. And with that, um, I saw that a lot of students had applied and it was just much more than I had expected. And, you know, seeing how many students actually applied, it was just really um, 
it was really nice to see that we were able to give back to our community in that way and see that students still wanted to continue utilizing our resources and also showed that students still needed us in that way. So I think, um, you know, seeing how we were able to replace our in-person pet food pantry with the online basic needs distribution, it was just good to see us utilizing our social media platforms in that way. So, you know, seeing how successful that was, I think um, at least I learned that we should be utilizing our social media platforms more and continuing to share our resources with our online community and offering everyone the same chance to, you know, benefit from more resources and, you know, regardless of their locations. I think one of the advantages of being in a virtual setting was that it allowed us to have like guest speakers that we couldn't normally have maybe in a normal year or it would have been a lot harder or maybe more expensive, um, which are all factors you got to consider when you're doing events. So one of my favorite events and probably like overall like highlight of being in, uh, like an intern with APERC was we got to have um, Philip Wang of Wong Fu Productions um, like speak at one of our events and like he we basically just had like an interview with him and he really got to like dive into like Asian representation and like kind of what's going on with the Asian and AAPI communities um, so that was just really cool because not only was like the event really like successful in terms of like attendance and it was like probably the most like attended event we had this year and like it was cool to see how many people really engaged in something that we were doing but it was just cool on a personal level just because like i've been watching wong fu since i was like 10 so like it was cool because in the beginning we had like a little moment where we got to like meet phil and it was like oh my god i've been watching you forever and like you changed my life sort of thing so it was really cool to just like get to talk to him for a bit what were some of the main challenges that you faced when trying to set up slash plan events? Yeah, so I think some of the main challenges when trying to plan events was trying to figure out how to get people to come. I was like, what is Harvard doing? What is Yale doing? What is USC? What is UCLA? What are they doing? How are they marketing? And nobody gave, no, there was no straight answer. Uh, a lot of students, with like the transition from in-person to remote, we're experiencing like burnout um, and a lot of like Zoom fatigue. I know I was, there were like some days where I would be on Zoom from like 11 to like 7 p.m., you know? Um, How do we market to an audience that probably just goes to class and it's like, we're done, we're done. Um, like when we were on campus, like you'll run into folks and you'll be like, hey, like, are you going to that ARC event today? You should definitely go, it sounds fun, there's gonna be food. Things like that you experience in person really helps with the turnout and engagement at events. And incentivizing events is also easier in person because food or snacks are almost always served at our events. And people love having a meal that isn't dining hall food all the time. Um, so with the virtual scene, we've had a lot less options to incentivize with what we can um, do. So it made it kind of harder to get people to show up. So we wanted to uh, be very intentional with uh, centering our events. Um, around ways that we can best support students during these difficult times. What are some personal takeaways that you've learned this year that you would like to apply to next year once we're in person? Um, a personal takeaway that I've learned this year um, that I'll be applying in the next year is just asking people what they want. Um, as a student leader in a resource center and just in different organizations on campus, we're catering to the betterment of our community and our peers on campus. So asking peers what they would like to see or be involved in is really important and can make a, a big difference in involvement and will really make a difference in um, engagement as well. So just like straight up asking like, what do you wanna see? What do you wanna do? Like to really get folks excited about coming to events and learning about new things. What are some events that you're looking forward to hosting in person or virtually for this upcoming academic year? And what are your hopes for future events as well? So right now I'm currently uh, in the beginning stages of planning a couple events um, for the Sisters Not Sisters series. So Sisters for Sisters is S-I-S-T-E-R-S, -S, not Sisters, C-I-S-T-E-R-S, -S, which is about building solidarity um, between cis women and trans women and that, you know, centering the voices and experiences of trans women in particular and so with those events I'm currently working on um, uh, 
spearheading a screening of the documentary Disclosure, on most likely virtually, as well as a book discussion um, by the book, for, for the book, To My Trans Sisters by Charlie Craggs. Um, and so really it's just about building that solidarity and raising more awareness about the experiences of trans women, particularly, you know, the amount of transphobia that trans women face, particularly trans women of color and those experiences. And so um, that's what's coming up. And I'm hoping that this year um, we can collaborate more with other resource centers and um, do more for the trans and non-binary and queer people on campus. I think that's a really important thing to work on more visibility. An event that I'm looking forward to hosting, hopefully in person, um, is Welcome Black. We do a Welcome Black barbecue every year, um, fall quarter. And it's such a fun event in the beginning of the year to just welcome back welcome back ABC folks to campus and to welcome the new ABC folks joining campus for the first time. Um, there's always good food, we play games, we dance, um, we engage with different resource centers that are tabling at the event. It just feels like a really big family reunion and it's always such a good time to just rekindle relationships with folks and start building new relationships with other people. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that it, and hopefully the person again, because um, it really just feels like home um, and it's hard to recreate that in a virtual space, but I know that it's still be, it will still be special if it is virtual. Um, and for future events, like I'm just hoping for more engagement. I know that there will be more engagement just because we've all missed being in those spaces together. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and just looking forward to meeting new people and just having stronger connections with each other and with the other resource centers. So like I mentioned before, this is my first and last year at UCSC. So I'm really, really hoping that we get to host some in-person events. I would really like to meet everybody and just have that real university experience. But even if we don't, I think our virtual events will still be really fun. So I'm looking forward to a lot of the annual events that we have. Every year we do things like Indigifest, like I mentioned before, but we also have the Alma Muslim Speaker Series and we have uh, Indigia Thanks. I'm really excited for Indigia Thanks this year. It's our own take on Thanksgiving and kind of like reclaim that holiday as Indigenous people. So, and it involves food every time. So of course I'm very excited for that one. Um, and then also there are some events that I have been trying to get going of my own, my own personal ideas. And I'm really hoping to make those happen. So stay tuned and yeah. I think we'll have a lot of really special events this year. What are your hopes for the future given what you have learned from this past year? Um, so I mentioned this before, um, you know, how the RCs had to figure out new and creative ways to connect with the community and find ways to um, continue engaging with our students and help them engage with each other. So for the ERC, I know we definitely had to learn or do this by learning how to transition our all of our resources to online platforms. So like basic needs, gift card and face mask distribution and the our online giveaways. So I think with that being said, um, what I learned most th about this past year was, you know, definitely being able that everyone was able to adapt to any situation given to us since you know, the virus came out of nowhere um, and, you know, everything had to change. So suddenly everyone had to go home, start working and learning from home. So I think, you know, even in the beginning when everything was like very uncertain and very like shaky and we didn't know what we were going to do. I think even with that, all, all that going on, our sense of community was still there. I think amongst like even between the ERC and like all the RCs together, we were all still able to like talk to each other and connect and like support each other and like how we're going to move on or how what the next step is going to be and like how to reach out to our students so i think this sense of resiliency where everyone had to deal with the um the hard reality of the virus and the pandemic and how everyone had like um a lot going on we were still able to support each other and reach out to the students and um also like reach out to new students that were just starting their their college um in that way too so with that being said, I hope in the future the ERC and like all the other RCs know that 
regardless of our situation or regardless of what's happening to us, we are able to continue supporting each other. Um, we're able to continue building the sense of community. And just like that, we have come to the end of our conversation. I want to extend another thank you to all of our guests for joining us in such a special episode. We want to extend a thank you to Desiree, Yu Yao, Cameron, Abby, and Kaz for all of the background work that they've been putting behind the cameras. Um, for more reading material, please check the link in the description. Um, this has been a difficult year for all of us, and I just want to honor all of y'all's resiliency. Um, we have found ways to adapt to a new way of life and yet still maintaining that sense of community throughout. Um, if y'all enjoyed listening to this conversation that we have had that we had today um, and would like to hear more, please feel free to subscribe to our channel. Thank you all so much. Please get vaccinated and I hope to see all of y'all's beautiful faces on campus. Take care.